Hi, everyone. Welcome to the New Evangelicals podcast. My name is Tim Whitaker. I am the host of the show. The New Evangelicals is a nonprofit organization holding space for folks marginalized by the evangelical church, advocating for accountability in evangelical spaces, and helping people explore the Christian tradition beyond the basement of evangelical fundamentalism. This podcast aims to bring you a guest that hopefully challenges your preconceived notions of your own faith tradition or helps you think outside of your own box. So join us here every week, sometimes more than that, for a new episode talking to a new guest. With that being said, I want to say two more things. Number one, if you like the podcast, please give us a rating and a review or subscribe to us on YouTube. And we are a nonprofit organization holding space for thousands of people trying to renegotiate their faith. If you want to help be part of that work, you can donate at the link via our show notes. All donations in the U.S. are tax deductible. All right, friends, let's get into this week's episode. All right. Well, uh, Keith Giles, good to have you on the podcast. I've seen you around on the internet all over the place, on Twitter, on Facebook, in our Facebook community. So it's really nice to finally meet you in person and have you on the show. Thanks for making time. Tim, uh, I am so excited to be on this podcast with you. And uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of cool to actually see a face behind um, all that social media stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It always, it is. Yes. Whenever I do this work, I meet someone who I follow. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's nice to have a face behind the name. Now you are, you're a pretty prolific writer. I mean, you've written a lot of books and spanning all kinds of topics uh, regarding spirituality and religion and the Christian tradition. I I do want to hone in on one of them and we'll get there in a minute. But but, but before we do that, I do want to ask, you know, how did you grow up regarding your faith tradition? Did you grow up more evangelical like myself or did you kind of come from the outside in? What's your story there? Yeah, well, I definitely grew up um, uh, evangelical. I was specifically Southern Baptist. Uh, ended up becoming licensed and ordained Southern Baptist in um, in my twenties, late twenties, about thirty three years ago, and um, so served on staff at different churches, you know, in that capacity for a long time. Um, then my wife and I moved to California, got involved with the vineyard church movement and that Mm. kind of thing. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I spent a good long time in evangelicalism and, um, like you and many others, uh, eventually, I think we know what helps. I, I do think, uh, what accelerates that deconstruction process for a lot of people is if you are on staff and, um, you know, there's just things that go on in the background on that Monday morning staff meeting when you're kind of, um, you know, uh, doing a postmortem on the Sunday morning service and the kind of things they (laughs) measure and the kind of things they say, this is success. How many people were there? How many people took a recording? Because we used to do CDs of the, of the sermon. Uh, Um, You know, that kind of, how many people went forward, all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, just all the things they value, which was more like, literally, I can't believe this, but I, when I was on staff at this, the last church I was at literally on a Monday morning staff meeting, there was a whole conversation about, um, you know, targeting the young, the young hip uh, entrepreneurs and their children who came to visit. And did you see them? Did you see that guy? Oh, he owns this business. And then, then it was like well, the pastors were being assigned. Uh, you invite him over for dinner and see if you can get him to join, you know, the children's ministry or sign up for youth ministry or do join the men's ministry so he can get his wife involved. And and um, I remember this was one. <laughs> That's one of the last meetings I was at. I remember that was going, that conversation was going on. I just raised my hand and I said, did anybody notice the woman that came that had the two young girls and she's um, divorced and she's a single mom trying to pay her bills? Who of us is going to invite her over for dinner? Hmm. Because the choice, the, the focus was, was so much on, um, you know, the people with the money that we wanted to rope in and get them involved and plugged in and like, but what about the guy that came and, you know, he's been out of work for six months. Um, did anybody talk to him and who's having him over for dinner? And it just, mm. so that kind of stuff bugged me. It just really did. Yeah. And that was probably a big part of uh, what kind of made me rethink the whole church and Christianity thing. Yeah. So I'm kind of curious about that actually, because people that I meet in these spaces, I kind of find one of two different ways. They, they either say it was kind of like a, a, a slow boil over time that eventually led them to a roaring boil where they just kind of said, I, I need to rethink things. Um, or it was a moment that they remember very clearly of, you know, maybe it was Trump or it was this thing at church. For <laughs> you, you know, what, what was kind of your journey going from 
being in these evangelical spaces to being really outside of those spaces, but still firmly seated in the Christian tradition. Yeah, it's it's tough to say this is the moment, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, for me, I guess there wasn't like a single moment that it was like I just said to myself, I'm out. Um, it, so yeah. it was a little gradual. Um, I typically will point to there were sort of two things that happened almost immediately back to back when I was on staff at that same church. Um, one was reading this article by a guy named Ray Mayhew um, called The uh, Embezzlement, The Corporate Sin of American Christianity. Mm. And it was like this 40 page PDF. I think I got it through Shane Claiborne or somebody. And um, it was just a historic look at the early, the history of their church, starting in the first century, going through the third century, fourth, uh, fourth century, um, documenting how caring for the poor was like part of the DNA of the early church. And that resonated with me so much. And mm. I just didn't see that same kind of value in the church around me. And then, um, and then right around the same time, um, I just kind of had my, the doors blown off <laughs> my, Christianity, as I knew it up to that point, um, I was interviewing this guy. I was At the time, I was writing for Relevant Magazine. Oh, okay. And um, I interviewed this guy. And the question, the big question for the article was, what would you say is the greatest problem with the church in America today? Mm. And this was like mid-90s, I believe. And then um, he, uh, the guy I was interviewing said, well, it's because we misunderstand the gospel. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. And he goes, you know, the gospel isn't about saying a prayer so you can go to heaven when you die. And I'm like, and again, I'm a licensed entertained pastor and everything. I'm on staff at a church. And he said that. And I was like, it isn't. Um, and he's like, no, you know, the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Jesus, you know, Jesus, he's, he's the one that says, this is the good news, the gospel. And the way he explains the gospel is not about saying a prayer to go to, when you go to heaven after you die, his whole thing is the good news, right? The gospel is the good news. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is right now. And you can enter that reality this very moment, and you don't have to wait till after you're dead. And that just rocked my world, man. Mm. So if there was a moment, it was probably that. Because that mm. whole thing reoriented. It was a major paradigm shift for me. It really, you know, I say it rearranged the furniture in my, uh, the spiritual furniture in my mind. And it caused me to go back and rethink pretty much everything. And that rethinking process. So it was because I was like, well, if I'm wrong about this gospel thing, <laughs> what else am I wrong about? And it was like, uh, I just started questioning everything. And so immediately, not immediately, but within a few months after both of those things, my wife, Wendy and I stepped away, left, I would say I left the, left the pulpit to follow Jesus. Um, we started a church and met, that met in people's living rooms and homes and, um, all of the offerings we collected went to care for the poor in our community, families living in motels and people like that. And we did that for 11 years. And that was also a pretty radical shift because that, that experience of church, which was for the sake of other people, mm. not for ourselves, um, a church that gave everything away, uh, and also wasn't under any kind of denominational umbrella, which gave us absolute freedom to question everything to read, I could study, I could, I could read Marcus Borg. I could read John Dominic Crossan. I could even read Bart Ehrman and <laughs> no one was going to get upset at me. So, yeah. um, you know, so that was pretty freeing and it really gave me the freedom to question stuff that, you know, eventually became all these books that I wrote, um, on all these different kind of doctrines and pillars of the evangelical faith. Yeah, it's so interesting because um, there are a lot of similar ingredients in my own history. Uh, you know, I was part of, uh, we weren't a church, but we kind of acted like it. And uh, just a group of people that just, you know, experienced real community, really good friends of mine who I was really bonded to. And we had no oversight from like a denominational perspective. So we could, yeah. you know, just kind of explore. Now, we were still firmly seated in evangelical spaces, but it still felt very fresh. I mean, I remember hosting up on Wednesday nights at my house, a few friends of mine, we would get some Chinese food and just ask questions like, well, what is really the gospel? And kind of trying, I mean, we were amateur theologians, but we're doing our best, right, <laughs> to understand the, these things. And I, I also had a moment, it's funny that you mentioned, um, you know, the idea of maybe the gospel isn't about just going to heaven when you die. Because Rob Bell, you know, that famous mm -hmm. heretic uh, oh, you know, yeah. who, who John oh, yeah. Piper uh, canceled effectively, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> he, in one of his sermons from a long time ago, he asked the question, if 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 there was no afterlife, would you would you still follow Jesus? It was something like that. But of course, mm -hmm. he asked it in a very Rob Bell way. 
I remember thinking yeah. like, oh, like would I? Yep. Oh, I I don't I don't know. Like, yeah, that's a great point. And that was one of those moments in my life that sticks out to me even now where it was like I never thought about things beyond just like, well, Jesus gets me into heaven. So I, I really resonate with that way of, of starting to shift how you view the gospels and maybe what the calling of Christ is. So, okay. So that's, that's helpful to understand. Now you, when did you start writing like book after book after book? It just feels like, you know, I look at your Amazon page and it's like, holy smokes, this guy has so many books out. When did you become a writer? Like, like in the capacity that you are now? Yeah. Well, so a little bit around the time I was writing for Relevant Magazine. So when I had my big epiphany about the gospel and did house church and all that stuff, I started, in addition to writing for Relevant, I started blogging uh, initially over at Blogspot. And um, some of those blogs I turned into, I self-published about four books um, before I started working with choir publishing. Um, and that, so um, that, that the first book that I published with a, an actual publisher was Jesus Untangled, Crucifying Our Politics, The Pledge of Allegiance to the Lamb. And uh, that that published on Inauguration Day for Donald Trump. And um, the rest is history. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> uh, yes, that book was was uh, prophetic and ahead of its time. I was it was the warning, the warning sound that not many people unfortunately listen to. And here we are. Mm, yeah. Yeah, here we are it is exactly right. Yeah. And as of this recording, we're recording this before the midterms. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, um, you know, I guess I guess we'll see how it all pans out as people listen to us in real time saying, man, what was it like being in the dark? You know, <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so, OK, I, I want to focus really on, on one particular topic. This is actually how I first discovered you. Someone sent me a debate you did with someone on universalism uh, mm -hmm. on, on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you wrote a book, uh, Solo Mysterium, celebrating the beauty, beautiful uncertainty of everything. Uh, yeah. this came out, uh, this year, 2022, which is yeah. awesome. And, mm -hmm. uh, David Bentley Hart, who is kind of, you know, uh, in, in my circles, he's kind of the person you go to for universalism or universal reconciliation, I should say, uh, gave the book a shout out. So props yeah. to you. That is so cool. Um, <laughs> so you. I'm, I'm kind of curious, you know, when, because you, you're on this journey, of being in this evangelical spaces, kind of having questions. I'm sure hell at some point had to play a role in oh, how yeah. like you were thinking about things, you know? So can you kind of maybe talk about your personal journey going oh, yeah. from, I'm assuming an eternal conscious torment perspective to eventually landing at universal reconciliation? Yeah, absolutely. So it was, it was during that time we were doing our house church. Um, I was, you know, at, like you asking a bunch of questions about a lot of different things. What's funny is the, my, the, on hell specifically, my big, so my epiphany in that area was, um, there's a friend of mine. His name is Steve Gregg. Uh, he has a radio show, which is syndicated in different places around. People may have heard of him. Uh, it's kind of like a Bible answer man type show where people call in mm. on the Bible questions and stuff like that. But I, I got to knew, I had gotten to know him. He actually visited our house church a couple of times. He's kind of a house church guy as well. Mm. And, um, Anyway, he was the first one that kind of blew my mind. Somebody had called in and asked a question about hell. And uh, and to me, this guy was, I mean, actually, even honestly, even today, he, he still is kind of evangelical, a lot of his theology. And yet, um, as somebody who had studied the subject way more than I had, uh, his answer to this guy's question blew my mind. This is what, this was the pulling the thread that sent me down the rabbit hole, right? So his answer to the question was, well... Um, you know, the early Christian church for the, about the first 400 years of church history. Now, just speaking from a historical perspective, this is just history. It's not a, not an opinion, not a doctrinal statement. It's just observable fact. You can, you can look it up. Um, that for the first three, 400 years of church history, there have always been. So from the beginning, there were Christians who held one of those three views. Those three views are eternal conscious torment, an annihilation, or what's called universal uh, reconciliation or, or pocketostasis is the, is the actual term, um, which is the idea that basically eventually everybody is redeemed and transformed. And um, so I didn't know that. And he even quoted the source. He was like, oh, there's, a, there's this um, theological encyclopedia that talks about the fact that, um, again, for like the first 300 years, there were sort of three schools or seminaries um, in the ancient world where those different Christians sort of taught and championed one of those three views, wh whichever they were. But then here was the other kind of the other thing that blew my mind. Um, he said, 
There was uh, one school, I believe, in it was in Rome. Yeah, it was in Rome. Yes, it was, because <laughs> that actually is key to the to the to the what happened later. The, the school in Rome is the one school that taught eternal conscious torment. I think there was one in Ephesus that taught annihilation, and then there were like four other schools in other cities that all taught universal reconciliation. So the majority view was universal reconciliation for about the first four or 500 years. So that fact alone blew my mind. No one ever told me that, mm. you know, mm -hmm. no, none of my pastors, no one from the pulpit, none in, in, in all my own studies I had done. No one goes, Oh, by the way, you know, the quote unquote biblical view or the Christian view. Um, there isn't one, there's three. And the view yeah. that you grew, the, the, the view I grew up with, the view I was, the only one I was ever told about was the minority view for about 500 years. So yeah. dang, that, that, that was like, okay, I need to look into this. That's what kind of set me in the direction. And so I, I'm very grateful to Steve Gregg for kind of showing me that because once I started digging into it, um, yeah, it, it blew my mind. And then I started reading these church fathers, um, who were like Gregory of Nyssa, um, Athanasius, you know, many others who um, were very universalist in their views, and I had no idea. So that 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 was a big deal for me, and that that's kind of what eventually led me to where I ended up. Well, I I share the sentiment of feeling like, wait a second, I thought I was a true Christian, and you never taught me that there were other ways of viewing the afterlife in the Christian tradition, right? I mean, in, in my spaces, right. it was. If you don't believe in ECT, you know, eternal conscious torment, you're just not a real Christian. Like you're, it right. was hinted maybe you're liberal or you're, you know, on the path to atheism, um, or you, you don't, you, you don't take the Bible seriously, or you're, you're using your uh, feelings and emotions to read back into the Word of God. I mean, these are just uh -huh. things I heard. Um, oh, yeah, me too. I, I even remember specifically Francis Chan and, um, and, um, Preston Sprinkle co writing that book. Yep. Um, man, what's Erasing it called? Hell. I'm blanking on Erasing it. Yeah, hell. thank you. Erasing hell. Although they didn't uh, quite know, erase advocating it, but... <laughs> for, <laughs> and you know, I, I think for evangelicalism, it's about as, maybe as fair as you can get because they they did at least offer annihilationism as as a as a perspective. Um, yes. But still, I I, re I remember that happening, right? Um, mm. And so I, I'm with you. Like I I feel a lot of of that, of that frustration of like, okay, I thought I really had a grasp on quote unquote historic Christianity, but in reality, it's such a big, massive tent with so many different traditions inside of it. It's right. kind of, a, I think, almost a fool's errand to think, well, I have fully grasped all these different things. So, okay. Mm -hmm. So, so, so you have this person, he, he blows your mind. My question is, I'm sure at the time you were still maybe an evangelical, which means, well, what does the Bible say about this? You know, of course. what does the Bible say about universal yes. reconciliation? Because you have the so-called clobber verses, right, that mention hell. So for you, as you studied the Bible, the Protestant Bible that we have, what were some of the, the, the moments where you went, oh, wait a second, I, I, I was taught to read this or that this way, uh, yeah. but upon further examination, maybe it's not as clear as I thought. Like, what were some of those moments for you that really shifted things biblically? Yeah, so it kind of was in both directions. So on the one hand, mm -hmm. I started realizing that those quote unquote hell texts, you know, that because yeah. I, I used to say this, my, I repeated this only because I had heard it, you know, told, somebody else told me, nobody <laughs> talks about hell more than Jesus. I and knew I'm you were like, going to say that. <laughs> right. You know that. Right, yeah. Right. And I, I yeah. remember, man, I stood up and I said the same thing. No one talks about hell more than Jesus. Right. Well, let's go look at that. Let's look at right. those texts <laughs> where Jesus is supposedly talking right. about hell. Let's um, fact check that. Yeah. Yes. And then, so on that side of things, it was like, oh, he's not talking about that at all. That's, he's mm. not talking about where anybody goes after they are dead. And mm. that's, so he, what, what's going on is, and I, in my book, I, I break this all out and I give examples and I cross reference it to the Old Testament. Um, so first I have to say, wh when it comes to eternal conscious torment, there is not a single breath, not a word, not a verse, not a mention of it in the Old Testament scriptures. So that Doctrine does not come to us through the prophets, does not come to us through the old, uh, the Hebrew scriptures. Um, that to me was a significant first because it was like, gee, God, you know, if your plan was to roast people for eternity, you think you would have mentioned that? Like, oh, right. darn it. I was going to tell Moses. I forgot all about it. Oh, well, you know what? I'm right. going to tell David. I'm oh, sorry, David. Damn, I forgot it. You know, I'm, I'll right. mention it to Isaiah. I'll tell Je uh, Jeremiah about that. Oh, darn. I keep yeah. forgetting. No, so it doesn't make any sense. Now, right. 
So let's go back to Jesus. So when Jesus is using these phrases, which we have been told to understand for, through this filter and lens of eternal conscious torment, right? Jesus yeah. uses phrases like, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, and where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, and the smoke of the torment will rise forever and ever. And we're, and so those are the kinds of phrases that you will read Jesus saying in the red letters in the Gospels, and people will say, aha, see, right there, he's saying, if you don't have faith in him, you're gonna, you're, that's going to be your, your fate in the afterlife is this eternal torment. Now, what we don't, what we miss and what we don't understand, which again, because no one taught us this, <laughs> because it's, it's been there in plain sight for a long, long time. You can find it anywhere if you look. Um, what Jesus is doing there is teaching, uh, it's a teaching style, which is a, a long tradition and uh, teaching style, uh, that was done by, by those Old Testament prophets, Jeremiah, Isaiah, um, all of them. And um, it's called apocalyptic hyperbole. So when Jesus is using those exact phrases, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, and the weeping and gnashing of teeth, and the smoke of the trumpet rises forever and ever, he's quoting Old Testament prophets. Now, again, none of those Old Testament prophets breathe a word about eternal conscious torment. So when he's quoting them, and they're not talking about eternal conscious torment, what are they talking about? The same thing he's talking about. It's using this apocalyptic end of the world type language. Again, it's hyperbole to warn them about a very real kind of invasion or destruction. Usually it's an invading army or attacking army of some type. Uh, and that's what happens when, you know, when that language is used to talk about Egypt or Assyria or sometimes even Jerusalem um, about this is what's going to happen if you don't repent, change your mind, turn around, whatever, stop what you're doing. Um, and so when Jesus uses that language in the Gospels, it's in the context of saying, you know, again, he even gives it a time frame. Some of you standing here will not taste death until everything I have told you comes to pass. So it was about a very real world type of destruction that was about to happen. And by the way, it did in 40 years. Uh, it was the destruction of Jerusalem in 8070. So those are apocalyptic hyperbole that Jesus is giving a warning about using this kind of language, which his listeners, his disciples, totally understood what he meant, that he was not talking about the end of the world. He was not talking about literal stars falling to the ground, and he was not talking about something that was going to happen to them after they died. Um, it was it was language used to describe a really bad thing that's going to happen that's going to sound like the end of the world, but it's really just the end of your world. Um, mm. And so, so again, this, this apocalyptic hyperbole language has overlap on the hell conversation as well as on the end times second coming conversation. So I, I have two books. So Jesus Unexpected covers the whole dispensational end times rapture theory stuff. It's some of the same verses and it's still apocalyptic hyperbole. Um, but the, again, in, in the hell situation, most of the time we're misunderstanding Jesus and what he's saying um, and, you know, misapplying those, those phrases to be about hell when that's not what he's talking about. I think that this uh, language of, of uh, hyperbole is so important to understand because, you know, in our culture, we do this all the time. Um, if I'm, if I'm carrying groceries and I tell my wife, oh, these bags weigh a ton. No one yeah. thinks I literally mean it weighs a, a ton. And then 2000 years from now, they read, wow, Tim must have been Superman being able to carry right. a ton. Carry Cause look, we can't do that now. Right. Or I think yeah. about, you know, if, if we're reading, uh, maybe in 2000 years from now, someone's reading a sports write up of LeBron yes. James, who was on fire at the last Lakers game. <laughs> no one's right. going to think, oh, LeBron James was literally on fire. Right. But no. But then with the Bible, with the framework that we've been given, I think from our evangelical heritage of just, hey, you just read this on its face. You read it literal. There's uh -huh. no translation things to worry about. We got to write in English. <laughs> and then you start reading it and you yeah. start taking these things literally. And before you know it, you end up in a lot of confusion because even the, the scriptures itself – don't align. Like, I mean, Paul says the wages of sin is death, not eternal conscious torment for all mankind, right? That's or right. Uh, for, for all, all the time. So even there, yeah. you would have a discrepancy reading it literally, if that makes sense. That's exactly right. And so, by the way, that same kind of thing is, um, is likely what's happening in some other Old Testament texts. Um, for example, the, the Canaanite text where it's like, you know, where God says, go and destroy them and wrap them out, blah, 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 every man, woman, and child. Um, because, by the way, we have found um, ancient tablets from, um, uh, what was it? I think it was the, the king of the Midianites. 
I think it was the Midianites. Anyway, um, where it's a, it's a stone tablet and it's the history of this king. I think it was of Midia. And, and in the tablet, basically he says that he went to war with Israel and he destroyed, he wiped them out. He killed every man, woman, and child. And of course we know that isn't true. That didn't happen. So in, so it's likely in the Old Testament text when it talks about them going to war and killing every man, woman, and child, it's also not true. It's this, it's the way you talk. And like your, like your example is perfect, Tim. Because again, it's it's like when I if I were to tell you, oh my gosh, man, did you see that game the other night? Man, the Lakers murdered the Phoenix Suns. They destroyed them. I mean, they just killed them. Now, I don't mean that they murdered them. <laughs> and you know that I don't mean that. But that's kind of the way they talked back then. It was like, how can we tell the history of how great our king was and how how victorious we were in battle? Let's just mm. overstate it to this ridiculous level. And it's just right. to sort of make the point, we got them, right? That's all yeah. it means. Makes sense. All right. So so you obviously, as you were digging, you find, hey, the Bible's not nearly as clear about ECT being the dominant perspective, but advocating yeah. from a negative still doesn't get us to universal reconciliation. So, True. So what did you start reading and discovering that was like, hey, you know what? I think... If I had to take a you know a best guess on what the Bible is talking about, I'm gonna lean not towards annihilationism uh, or ECT, but towards universal reconciliation. So, how did you kind of start landing there? Right. Um, well, like I said, so there were sort of a, it was a two sided um, discovery for me. So one was on the side that there was there was little to no evidence of eternal conscious torment being something that was literally taught by Jesus or anywhere in the Scripture. So that was that side of it. The other side of it is like you're saying. Um, the uh, the scripture scriptural evidence in favor of universal reconciliation, and um, I've found like seventy six verses in the New Testament, or in, even in the Old Testament, um, that I believe very strongly suggest um, that yes, God's intention is to uh, redeem and restore. Like He says, "Behold, I make all things new." That is uh, his intention, and mm -hmm. God will, I believe, God will accomplish that. So there's lots of verses. I'm going to have some of my favorites. And we can talk about some of those, but, um, sweet. Yeah. There are some, there's a couple that really just, um, that I think really helped me. So one of them was, was recognizing that, um, one of my favorite ones is Romans. Um, so hmm. most Christians, again, like we were saying, don't understand the way their scriptures are written. And some often they're written in either, like we said, apocalyptic hyperbole. That's one thing. There's another thing called prosopopoeia. And this is another okay. uh, style of arguing and writing um, that's used by Paul uh, quite often in, in the New Testament and especially mm. used by Paul in the book of Romans. So um, I think most Christians, uh, I'll, I'll say put myself in that category, have read, read Romans completely missing the point of Romans. Um, that starting in chapter 1 of Romans straight through to the end of chapter 11 is written in this prosopopoeia style. And what is that? So prosopopoeia is a, um, it's an argumentation device. It's a sort of a mock debate. So there's one author. So it's, it's one person who's writing the debate, but he's trying to fairly represent both views. So he's not trying to straw man. He's trying to speak. Here's what somebody who disagrees with me would say. These would be their object objections to me. And then I'm going to, I'm going to let them speak. And then I'm going to answer that objection. I'm going to take my time and walk through this step by step, point by point until I prove beyond a doubt, that my side is true. My side is correct. So if you understand that that's what Paul is doing in, in the book of Romans, um, that he starts off, and there are two voices throughout the chapter 1 through, through the end of chapter 11 in this sort of mock debate. And so one of them would, is, would be Paul himself. We'll say Paul, the teacher of, of grace or the gospel. And the other, the other voice, really, it's easy for Paul to speak in this voice because this is who he used to be. It's sort of Saul the Pharisee the teacher of the law. And so if you read, if you understand that, okay, that's what's going on here, just start, go back into Romans and start reading it. And I encourage you to try this. Start reading it, looking for those two back and forth voices. And you'll see it's a back and forth all the way through. And it culminates at the end of chapter 11. The conversation um, near the beginning of, of that conversation and debate in Romans, the prosopopoeia debate, uh, essentially the question arises, Will all Israel be saved? 
because it sure looks like that's not what's happening right now, right? They, the mm. Jews have rejected Christ. They've rejected the gospel. Um, and yet there's supposed to be this promise that God says all Israel will be saved. So how is this possible, Paul, if, if you're right? Because this doesn't seem to be the right thing. And so it's this back and forth trying to get at the answer to that. And uh, the whole thing culminates at the end of, in, in the middle of chapter 11, near the end of chapter 11, where Paul basically then finally, he, he finishes his argument by making this point, And he says um, that God has um, bound up or consigned everyone into disobedience, right? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? So God has bound up everyone in disobedience so that God can show mercy on all or on everyone. And then here's how you know that that was the end of the debate. Because the very next couple of verses right after that is Paul, what I, I call it doing a high five in or like an end zone dance. He's doing like a little dance in the end zone. Like, oh, the glory of God, you know, the riches of God. Who can know, who can fathom the greatness of the good, the glory of God? And he just has this huge um, celebration right after he makes this point. And then the beginning of chapter 12 is, therefore, therefore what? Well, I just proved this point. That God's plan is to save everyone. God's plan is to show mercy to everyone. So therefore, in view of this, right, how then should we live? Well, that's, that's, then, then it becomes, the rest of Romans becomes this whole thing about in view of that, in light of that, now what? Okay. Well, renew your mind, right? Live in the, live in this other way, live in this Christ-like way, because you know that God who loves you has done this beautiful thing. Um, to me, that's one of the most powerful ones. But again, most of us don't see it because we don't recognize that that's what's going on in Romans. We, so we Wait, we miss Keith, that Keith, end of 11. Yeah. I have to interrupt you. I'm okay, sorry. please. Okay. Are you trying to tell me? Uh, because, you know, Romans 9 is clear, Keith. And who are uh, you, oh man, to talk back to God? Uh -huh. You know, Romans 9 and Romans is all about people being predestined to burn mm -hmm. forever. Or, or, or to be hand plucked by God so that yes. you're saved. Are you telling me that, that, that maybe just maybe that's not what Romans is all about ultimately? That maybe there's, there's something deeper happening. Is that what you're trying to tell me here? Yes. I'm trying to tell you there's way, something way deeper going wow. on. So again, in Romans My nine, like blown. that, what you're talking about there is that's part of this ongoing battle back and forth. So mm. what, what I find really fascinating, by the way, is that once you go through and map out you know, who, which voice is speaking in Romans 1 through 11? Like when most of, of evangelical Christians' favorite verses are the ones from Saul the Pharisee. They don't pay attention <laughs> to the answer that Saul, the teacher of the gospel, gives in rebuttal of that. Hmm. So, so that specific thing you're talking about, what that verse actually says is, what if God has consigned some hmm. for destruction and some for, you know, his glory or whatever. Um, it's a what if. But again, the, the conversation keeps going. And what it culminates in is Paul saying, here's, what's, here's what we know, that right. God has consigned everyone to disobedience. Why? So he can show mercy on everyone. And then that's the mic drop celebration in zone dance. Woohoo. See, I, I, this is the point <laughs> I'm trying to make here. So, um, yes, you can go back and say, but what about back over here? Well, that's, you know, in the middle of the argument, like keep reading, <laughs> keep on going, keep reading and you'll see that well, he ends in something different. And of course, that's not that, the only verse. Yeah. There's way many, many, many other verses, especially from Paul, um, that, uh, that kind of argue for this idea of universal reconciliation. Well, I just find it so interesting because I grew up in a Calvinist framework. That was kind of what I was taught as as the absolute. Uh, you know, the Bible is clear, and and the farther I, I get away from what I, what I call the basement of evangelicalism, the more I realize is I know that folks claim to be standing on God's truth, the Bible, but really they I have found that that they do a great job of, of picking and choosing verses and kind of weaving like their own narrative that kind of creates this this reality this. I would call it a myth, but but this perception, at least, maybe <laughs> that you know, oh well, the Bible is clear, but in reality, we're just taking a verse from here, taking a verse from there, taking yes. a verse over here, and and we're saying it as if they're all they, they all have the same voice and the same, and they all share the same cultural moment and same history right. and same yeah. context, saying, look, the Bible is clear. When in yeah. reality, like you said, <laughs> when not. you start reading these collections of books 
uh, you know, t- all the way through and start actually studying it and really digging in, it's not maybe what, what people like me were taught initially. And the Romans 9 example, I bring it up kind of in jest because I can't tell you how often that was used to prove yeah. that God oh, yeah. is sovereignly determining who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. And if you don't like it, who were you, oh man, to talk back to God? So shut up and take it, you know? Uh-huh, so it's uh-huh. quite liberating liberating to think about these verses in different ways that actually make more sense about the goodness of God uh, that we're taught about, right? That God loves everyone and God loved the world, but, you know, uh, also Romans 9, so maybe not everyone, right? When in reality, we get to reconcile <laughs> these things together. That is very helpful for me. Yeah, so let me let me give you another verse because this one's a lot. Le- this one doesn't take a long time to explain, and it's not super complicated. Oh, go for it. I love this so, stuff. This is great. So, so one of the ones that again, when I saw this, it blew my mind, and it gets to your point about the Bible being so difficult for the average person to just again. So what I've learned is that our English translations are really corrupted and really messed up. Okay, they are usually our English translations of the scriptures are typically done by committees that are denominational that have a have an assumption like you said maybe they're reformed maybe they have a dispensational and so those those committees as they're going through to translate the scriptures are sometimes making choices that are misrepresenting or slightly changing or putting a little spin on something that doesn't belong there right so here's one of the ones that blew my mind and this was like I saw this and I was like well, damn, <laughs> I wish I didn't know this. <laughs> so um, there's the verse. I'm looking it up real quick to make sure I get this right. So Philippians 2, 10 through 11. Now, growing up at Southern Baptist, um, again, when I read this verse and when I heard this ber- verse preached from the pulpit, it was always from the perspective of eternal conscious torment, right? So here's mm-hmm. the verse, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, when that was spoken, I mean, the picture, the mental picture in my mind, and usually it's 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 literally what was said from the pulpit in the context of that verse was, see, those filthy sinners, one day Jesus yeah. is going to blow the trumpet, they're going to look up, their the hearts are going to sink, they're going to be like, oh crap. And then their knees are going to hit the ground and the, through gritted teeth, they're going to say, Jesus is Lord. And then he's going to throw them into hell. Yes. Right. I mean, that's, that's the language picture. that we hear now with Christian nationalism too. They use that, like, that, that they use that verse to prove yes. that they're ultimately yes. going to conquer their enemies. Exactly. Yes. Okay. So here's the thing though. There's a missing word in your English translation. And again, I invite oh. anybody to go. You don't have to even you know, be a Greek scholar or have a interlinear New Testament or anything. You can go to blueletterbible.com and look up Philippians 2, um, what is it, 10 through 11, and notice that when it gets to this part, so here's the little tiny change that is made in your English translation. Um, it really should say, um, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, those in heaven, those on earth, blah, 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 and that every tongue would gladly confess. So the word gladly isn't there, but it should be because the Greek word for confess there is the word exomologio. And if you just look up the definition of exomologio, the first listing, not the second, the third, the fifth, the alternate, the weird, obscure usage of exomologio. The first usage of exomologio is to acknowledge openly and joyfully. So what Paul is saying there which again, I have to say there was a little bit of an agenda here in the way that got translated. Because if it, if it actually said, you know, the day is going to come that every knee will bow and every tongue will gladly confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Mm-hmm. That's a very different picture. And especially if you cross reference that with what, what something else that Paul says about what will happen to everyone who confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. They mm-hmm. will be saved as he says in Romans. So, you know what I mean? Like seeing Mm. that and realizing that was like, whoa, okay, that's kind of cool. And there's other stuff though that's way out in the open. There's, you know, there's places where there's two different times that Paul contrasts the ministry of Adam with the ministry of Christ, right? As in Adam Mm. all die, as in Christ all will be be made alive. Um, And I know people try to parse that. Well, no, not, when he says all with Adam, well, of course he means all because everybody, you know, we're all under sin and blah, blah, blah. But no, no, when he says Jesus, though, 
Well, but here's the problem with, with wanting to read it that way. On one of the places where Paul does that comparison, he uses the phrase, how much greater? He says, if, if sin and death came through Adam, right, through this one man, how much greater, how much more grace comes through Christ? It's not, because hmm. if you want to do it the other way, it's going to have to be how much less, because Adam covers everybody, and Jesus, it's not enough to cover everybody. It's We only have a little bit here, right? So, you know, mm. get get in line quick because we're going to run out really quick. No, Paul Paul contrasts it, but he contrasts it by saying that that Christ's uh, what Christ does is greater. It's even more. So there's so many places, man. We, again, like I said, there's like 76 verses um, that are out there that are in the scriptures. But again, you don't see them if you haven't sort of been shown to see them, if you've been sort of taught not to see them. It's all about this filter we mm. use, right? So again, to your point a minute ago. Um, you know, we, we kind of do have our filters. And again, like I said, you know, historically for like 400 years, Christians had one of three different views. And all, I would say all three of them, all three of those groups of people would have absolutely said, my view is a biblical view. Here's my mm-hmm. 76 verses that support my view of eternal torment or my view of annihilation or my view of reconciliation. And mm-hmm. so all three views do use scripture to support the view. And I want to put make that clear. So in a way, I, I say this in my book. So in a way, like you were saying, we all do this sort of pick and choose thing, right? Right. You, you, if you have the view up front, you say, these are the verses that matter. These are the verses that prove the point. These are the verses that change everything. But what about these other verses from these other views? Well, okay, now I need to explain those. So this is what I'm doing. I understand that's what I'm doing. And other people are doing it for their side to defend their view. They're all biblical views. Like you said, the Bible is not, quote unquote, clear about these things, which is why the Mm. church spent 400 years trying to decide what to believe on this specific topic. Um, And so at the end of the day, you have to just decide which one makes more sense to you, which one you land on, right? For me, a big part of my landing on this universal reconciliation was, yes, I do believe all of these verses are significant and powerful and mind-blowing. And I think they're, they, 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 to me, make the point that God's plan is for this universal reconciliation in the end, that all will be saved. Um, but it isn't just that. I, I, would, I would say it's also, I think that no matter which of those three views you have, you are not just saying what you believe about what happens to the unrighteous after they die. I think you have to acknowledge that you are also saying something about what you believe about the character of God. Mm-hmm. I would say that you, depending on which th- of those three views you take, you are saying that you believe that God is a torturer or that you believe God is a destroyer of those who reject him, or you believe God is a loving father who heals and restores his children. Mm. And for me, that the picture of, of the father as a God who is a, who is a father who loves his children, who will do anything in his power to restore them, redeem them, heal them, transform them. If he said that that's what he intends to do, I believe that God and God alone has that ability and that, that, that power to do exactly that. Um, and I think that's more for me, it's that view of God is more consistent with the God I see revealed in Christ. When Jesus says, if you you know, if you want to know what the father is like, look at me. And when I look at Jesus, what I see is a God who forgives. By the way, Jesus forgives everybody instantly. I don't think anyone ever asked him to be forgiven. He just said, your sins are forgiven. And then he would say, now what? What do you want me to do for you? Um, mm-hmm. So if, if I look at Jesus, what I see as a, is, is a father who is like Jesus and a father who forgives immediately, who is full of mercy and grace and kindness, and whose intention is to heal and restore and redeem his children. I think that's consistent with what we see in Christ. And again, your mileage may vary, but that's what I. <laughs> well, I, I one of the one of my issues of of why I left fundamentalism in evangelical spaces. Um, yes, I found some of the views problematic. I had issues with them, but the the level of arrogance and no, we are objectively true and you are <laughs> false. Um, really, really turned me off because like you said, it doesn't take a very deep dive to realize how complicated the Bible is. And I would have more respect 
for the James Whites of the world. Um, uh-huh. And they said, listen, yes, I'm a Calvinist. Yes, I believe that all things have been sovereignly decreed. However, I recognize in the Christian tradition, this is debated. People have different views on this. Uh-huh. I, I understand that. I just happen to land here. Instead, yes. we have the opposite. It's an arrogance thing. It's uh, you don't understand the Bible well. You don't get it. You don't know your your Greek. And 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 that to me <laughs> is such a fool's errand because, like you said, we're dealing with such complicated text. And the other thing I was going to say is, I, I understand. I, I I think your comment is valid. That listen, you can make the Bible say. Really, whatever you want. I mean, I mean, we we we've seen the Bible used as both a tool of oppression and a tool of liberation, depending on who's wielding it. Sometimes that's right. Um, but I, you know, when when I was a kid, I, I played with uh, Kinects, okay, and I had the roller coaster one. It was great. It did a loop de loop and everything. And and the reality is, I could take those pieces and I could make it really do whatever I wanted. I, I didn't have to build a roller coaster, but the set made the most sense when I built the roller coaster, like that's right. where all the pieces fit. That's well, what it was intended. Right. Yes. <laughs> right. And, and I, I find, um, you know, I've kind of moved myself from ECT more to annihilationism. And now I'm kind of in between that and universal reconciliation, because I'm finding that, that all the pieces that I'm aware of fit better in one of those two frameworks compared yeah. to eternal conscious torment, whether it, it, it's the idea of God as torturer, which to me at, on a moral level, I, I can't fathom, um, or it's maybe how complicated the scriptures are or how even the word hell is translated yes. from four different Greek words that don't <laughs> yes. all mean the same thing, exactly. right? So I, th- I feel like, like, yes, you could make the Bible say that people who don't pray a prayer before they die will burn forever in hell because God is just, but those pieces don't really fit super well for me after no. further examination. Does that make sense? Oh, no, totally makes sense. And by the way, I want I love what you said about... Um, teachers, again, like the way I grew up, and again, it sounds like the way you grew up and probably many of our listeners grew up as well. I, I, I've said exactly the same thing, Tim. I would have so so much appreciated in my, you know, a religious uh, education and growing up if, if people had just told me, now listen, um, there are three views of hell, for example, right? And here they are. Here's what they are. Here's who believed them. Here's some verses that they use. Here's what they would say to support it. Now, listen, we we tend to lean on this view. We think this view is correct. But just so you would know, here are these other views, right? And by the way, I can apply that to many other topics like the atonement, right? Hey, by the way, I just want you to know there's like eight (laughs) other atonement theories. The one that is the most popular, penal substitutionary atonement theory, it's actually started in the 1500s. (laughs) With John Calvin. So it's not the gospel. It can't be the gospel. Otherwise, no one taught the gospel until the apostle Calvin gave it to us. That's ridiculous. Right. There's like, what are the other views that, that started off right here? Here's what they are. And you could even say again, I'm fine if you say now of those views, I tend to lean on this direction. But I just want you sure. to know that there's others. There are other views out there. And, and you can, like I said, you can do this with so many things. And to your point, that would have been education. Education yeah. is telling me all of the information and allowing me to weigh it myself and make up my own mind. You and I and many of your listeners growing up in church and Sunday school, we did not receive Christian education. We received Christian indoctrination. We were told mm. there was only one way to view it. If they even mentioned there were other views, it was in the context of, and those people are heretics. And so <laughs> I'm... Right. So it took me so many years, right? If someone had done that to me when I was 12 or 20 or whatever, man, I, I wouldn't have deconstructed. I could have, I would have figured it out back then, <laughs> right? Now I'm just now catching up to like, oh, okay, now I can figure out what this is all about. Right. So we have a few minutes left. I, I, I want to maybe talk about some of the um, – pushback that I can think about when it comes to universal reconciliation, right? Not so much the biblical stuff, because that's obviously, it can be debated. But, you know, the idea, and and tell me if I'm wrong here, but I believe that, that, that Christian universal reconciliation is the concept that ultimately all things are reconciled through Christ. So even yes. people of, of, of a different religion or different belief system, at the end of the day, Christ is what reconciles them back to the Father, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So so that being said, you know, one of the first things that I hear about is, well, if everyone ends up, you know, redeemed and reconciled in, I guess, in, in, in some way in, in, in paradise or, 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 or in a redeemed world, uh, why, why not just do whatever you want in this world and just live however you want and just – 
you know, sin away and uh, who cares? At the end of the day, uh, everything works out. What's your response to that? <laughs> wow. Well, no, I have heard that. And isn't it a troubling, to me, that's such a troubling reaction. It's sort of like, like so the only reason you're not um, killing people and raping people and you know, ripping off, stealing things and, and just basically being this horrible person um, is just because, you know, you don't want to go to hell or you don't want to mm. experience this kind of ultimate punishment. Well, I don't know that it, it's, it's, it's another way of saying basically why follow Jesus, right? If, if I'm going to, if we're all going to make it, it's like, well, if you, anyone that asked me that kind of a question, I just want to say, do you really know Jesus? Cause I have loved knowing Christ. I have had an amazing, my life is so much richer because of Jesus and because of Christ in my life. Christ has brought me joy and peace and you know, helped me become a better human being, right? It, it, Jesus, following Jesus has taught me how to love my neighbor, how to love and receive love from other people. There's wonderful, amazing things, of course. I mean, would I want anyone to take Jesus away from me? No, of course not. I, I don't ever want to lose this connection that I have with Christ. But by the way, I don't think anybody can. But I mean, I wouldn't mm -hmm. want anyone to take it away. So when a Christian especially would ask from that direction, that's how I tend to hear it. It's sort of like, yeah, it sounds like what you're asking me is, oh, so I don't have to follow Jesus? I don't have to have this connection with him? It, so it seems like the if the relationship is only on this contractual kind of a thing. I do good things. I go to good place. Mm. Then, well, no, that's, you're thinking of this all wrong. That's not the point. So, I mean, I get in a wider sense of like, why would we, why would we encourage somebody who doesn't know Christ that they would, that they should. And again, to me, it comes back to this idea of like, well, because Jesus is awesome. Because I, I think Jesus is one of the most fascinating and amazing uh, individuals who has ever lived. And I think mm. I can still have a connection and, a, and a, through the Holy Spirit, I, I can have a connection and a relationship with Christ right now. And it's great. It's awesome. I mean, honestly, that is what I tell people who aren't Christians, you know, because I don't, if people ask me if I'm a Christian now, typically I don't want to say I'm a Christian. But what I will say is something like that. Like, you know what? I am fascinated and just... um you know, enraptured with this person of Jesus. I think Jesus is amazing. And I, and I'm every day of my life, I'm trying to follow the teachings of Jesus. And I believe I have a connection with Jesus and that I think it's awesome. I mean, if you wanted, you could, you could do that too. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's like, if you want to have a good life, if you want to live a good life and you want to have an, a, a life full of abundance and joy. And I, I mean, different people are going to have different answers to that question. For me, the sure. answer is, to follow yeah. Jesus. Yeah. And so it's not a it's not about this like oh you know hell is the only reason why I'm here I'm in the club. Now, but again, that is the reason most of us are here, right? Because that's the way we evangelize, right? That's right. when I was a kid, that was the way they, okay, raise your hand everybody if you don't want to burn in hell for eternity. I see that hand, brother. Repeat this yeah. prayer after me, ding, right. you're in. Well, if right. that's the way you got in here, if that's the way you entered this club of Christianity, then the, when someone tells you, oh, by the way, that whole thing, yeah, that's nonsense. Um, that isn't. So it, it, may, it will make you go, well, then why am I here? What, should I be here? Because that's the only reason I, I said initially said I would, you know, join this thing and become a Christian and whatever, pray that prayer. Um, right. But again, that's nothing. Jesus never did that. Jesus never, you know, had the shotgun wedding and said, hey, if you don't, I'm going to roast you forever if you don't do this. Okay, I'll do it. No, he never did that. It was always an invitation right. to follow me. And, and when you do follow me, you're going to walk in this way that is living this beautiful, abundant life of the kingdom, full of peace and joy and kindness and mercy and grace and uh, affirmation and all these beautiful things. So that's the invitation. Most of us got the wrong invitation. We, we thought we were going to a party where we didn't have to be tortured for eternity. That's not yeah. the invitation. The invitation is something else. And I think for a lot of Christians, they have to kind of rediscover that invitation. Like, no, this is what you're invited into. 
Okay. Yeah. You know, I'm kind of with you on that. Like that question was never that convincing to me of like, oh, well, I guess you blew the argument out of the water for universal reconciliation. <laughs> but this next question, honestly, is one of the reasons why I'm not sure if I'm fully convinced of the position and I lean more towards annihilationism. Sure. Um, what do you do with like, you know, the worst of the worst, so to speak, right, of our society? I mean, people yeah. who have done incredible uh damage atrocities mass murder genocides uh you know the the um the crusades etc you know I, I i have a hard time thinking that that when all things are reconciled i could be sharing a hammock uh next to a nazi you know that yeah. that doesn't make me feel good and the reason why i i find annihilationism i think at this point in my journey a little more compelling is because it gives some sense of of ultimate justice that also is not torturing someone for a trillion years right oh, sure. Sure, okay, sure. this person forfeited uh, their Imago Day and, and what I would argue would be the gift of eternal life, right? That's kind of the idea here. Uh, and yeah. therefore, because of, of how they how they lived and what they did with it, they forfeited that 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 being a part of that redeemed world because of, of how they were complicit in such uh, you know chaos and corruption. So for yeah. you as someone who holds to a universal reconciliation position, what is your answer to that? Especially I'm thinking about as we talk, you know, there are probably people listening who have been really um, abused, neglected, um, mm -hmm. maybe even sexually abused by someone, a faith leader or someone in their family. Yes. And the thought of that person being redeemed and being in quote unquote heaven or wherever yes. it, it, we end up is really nauseating. So what are your thoughts there? Oh, this, now, now we're talking, man. Um, so <laughs> let, me, let me start off by, I think this is how I want to start off to respond to that. Hmm. Um, I think we have to recognize that sometimes our definition of justice is no different than revenge. Mm -hmm. When we start talking about, oh, someone who did something really horrible well, that person doesn't deserve grace. That person needs, we need to give that person some justice and that justice looks like a whole lot of pain and suffering, right? The truth is when we, when we have that kind of, and again, I, I, I want to totally acknowledge people who have been, who have suffered, who have been brutalized or uh, abused or things like that. Absolutely. I know, I know where that feeling is real and I know, I know where that comes from. So I, I I'm not downplaying that at all. And I'm going to get to that in a second. Okay. But again, just in, in a general sense and in and, and the view of grace and view of forgiveness and, and mercy and transformation. Um, a lot of times when people will suggest this kind of thing, like, well, but what about those really bad people? Um, you know, justice must be served. It seems like if God just forgives people and just he forgives them and, and, and transforms them and they just make they just walk into heaven. That, that, that there's no justice there. And so I want to say, okay, so what you're telling me is what you really, really hope is that when you die, God lays you down in the fire for a couple of hundred years and just roasts you and tortures you. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm under the blood of Christ uh, and the grace of God. I, I, I'm forgiven. My sins are forgiven. I just get to walk in. Oh, I see. So grace for you, mercy for you, not for that guy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so that's really what we're doing. We're playing this game of like, oh, no, no, I want absolute forgiveness. I don't want to suffer anything. You know, I'm under the blood of Christ. So my sins are covered. The other guy, no, his sins are not covered. And again, so because so in our minds, we feel like, well, justice needs to be done for these. Other, these other people have to have to experience, quote unquote, justice. But again, when we define justice, it looks a lot more like revenge. Um, the other thing then about this is. The part of us, as you were saying in the, in that scenario, right? So, um, if I, I'm a good Christian, I follow Jesus, um, I've not done anything horrible, but I have suffered and someone hurt me, someone abused me, someone did this horrible thing to me. And I get to heaven and there they are. And you said, you know, the part of me is like, that guy shouldn't be here. What's he doing here? Hmm. So here's the thing. Mm -hmm. We will all be redeemed and transformed. Both the, the, the abuser, the person that did the horrible thing, the quote unquote sinner, that person will be a different person. That person will not be the person who did that to you. This is a per, this is who this person was before they got corrupted into what they became. Okay. So mm -hmm. they are brand new. They are restored and redeemed. And so are you. And the part of you that still needs that person to hurt or bleed or suffer. That part of you is also transformed where you actually are joyful when you see that person. 
you would go and embrace them and say, oh man, isn't God awesome? We're all here. Mm-hmm. And, and God's grace and God's love and mercy and forgiveness is, is good enough even to save Judas or Hitler or, or the, the child abuser or yes, whoever this person, whatever this person has done, there's no one who's beyond the love and the grace of God. Now I understand that right now, not everybody can hear what I'm saying from a place of rejoicing, right? But this, I think this whole question of, of mercy and justice is something that we do have to wrestle with uh, ourselves, right? It's, I think it's one of the very telling things, right? That, uh, what is it? Micah 6, 8, where, you know, oh, oh man, what, what does God require of you? Um, you know, so th- those the, the 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 two parts I think we struggle with, right, are like um, to love mercy and do justice. Doing justice is sort of like seeing something that's wrong and making it right. Most of us don't have a problem with that, right? Walking humbly with your God, we don't have much much trouble with that. It's that second one to love mercy, because again, um, the way we are today, the way you know we're we're not fully transformed, we haven't fully been redeemed in in this in the image of Christ yet. And I think this is a good example of it where like, you know, if, so if, if I did something really horrible or if my, let's say my son, one of my sons did something really, really horrible and they got arrested and they're on trial. And during the trial, the judge says, you know what, you you did it, you deserve it, but you know what, Uh, this time I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to reduce your sentence or I'm going to let you off. I'm going to, how would I react? Oh God. Oh God, you're so awesome. This is so good. Thank you, God. Your mercy is so wonderful. So when mercy is shown to me, when I do something bad, and 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 instead of getting what I deserve, I get mercy. Ha! Huh, isn't it awesome? Mercy is great. It's when I see that same mercy given to somebody else. That guy did. He did what? And he, and he received mercy. Oh no! See now something in me rises up against that. I don't like that. I don't like when someone else receives mercy. And I think this is part of what we're wrestling with is the idea that mercy is good. Mercy is so good. And in fact, it's so good. I not only should I enjoy it, I should be willing to share that and extend that to everyone that, that I would love mercy. And, and that's not the same, right? As that person needs to suffer for some amount of time. Right. And then just, just to, just to real quick, cause I, uh, I feel like this is, um, uh, kind of a capstone to that conversation hmm. um, because this is also a verse that uh, that helps me anyway to, to rethink that this whole question of what is God doing and what's God's ultimate you know plan and it's Hebrews 12 5 through 11 most Christians have heard this verse many many times I would encourage you to read it and try to read it through a different lens um, where it says God disciplines um, his children because he loves them right he disciplines those he loves and then it says and all of us undergo, undergo discipline. I think right there, it's telling us some pretty amazing things. God disciplines those he loves. He disciplines his children. Oh, and by the way, all of us undergo discipline. So I would say we're all loved and we're all God's children. Then it keeps on going and it says that God disciplines us for our good. Why? So we can share in the holiness of God. So God's discipline it has a purpose. It has an end game and it's not torture and it's not death and destruction. It's so that it's for our good so that we can share in the holiness of God. And then that passage wraps up by saying that this process yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And the, the major difference between universalism and the other two views in all three views, there is this metaphor of passing through the fire, right? Mm-hmm. The yep. difference, the major difference is in universalism this is, the, is the nature of that fire. Mm-hmm. Eternal conscious torment says the nature of that fire is to, is to torture you for eternity. Annihilation says the, the nature of that fire is to burn you up and you cease to exist. And in the universalism, the fire, the purpose of the fire is, is the fuller's soap, the refiner's fire. It's refining, it's restoring, it's burning away, as Paul says, all of these impurities and revealing gold, silver, and precious stones. But then he says, even if you go through the fire and everything is burned up and nothing remains, meaning there is nothing good in you, there is nothing redeemable in you, Paul says, and yet they will be saved, even as those who pass through the fire. So from the universalist perspective, 
the fire isn't a bad thing. The fire is a good thing. It's this, it's this process, this refining process where we all go through it, by the way, in the universal reconciliation view, it's not that no one goes through the fire. It's that everybody does. Billy mm -hmm. Graham, Mother Teresa, me, you, everybody, good or bad, quote unquote, good or bad. We're all, what, how, how do we determine that? Right. Everyone goes through the fire and the, the, we come out the other end, uh, being made you know, so that we can share in the holiness of God, that we can bear this peaceful fruit, fruit of righteousness so that we become transformed into the image of Christ, no matter who we are, no matter what we've done. Okay. So, um, technically I'm over time, but with your permission, can I kind of push you on this a little bit more? Do you mind Let's with do that? It. Because I, I have some thoughts here. Yes, I want yes. to have this dialogue because uh, frankly, I hear what you're saying. Um, and I wrestle with this because, well, well, myself, I've never, um, suffered, um, you know, serious abuse or, or trauma. Um, yeah. we have so many in our community who I, I can hear them listening to you talk and say, I think Keith means well, but he doesn't know what happened to me, or he doesn't know that my abuser is still not repentant, or he doesn't know, right. you know, insert thing here. Right. Sure. And, and what I think I wrestle with so much is that. And maybe this is because our society is built on um, retributive justice, right? Yes. But I course. just have such a difficult time with the concept of, of, of I'm not talking about I stole a candy bar or, or you know, I yelled at my <laughs> kid one time or something right. like that. I'm talking about things that, at least in our psyche, in our society, uh, the impact of harm uh, committed to other human beings is so um, unfathomable. It's hard to measure, right? I mean, just the, the, the permanent amount of damage that, that has been done. Um, and I know that people will use the Hitler example as kind of, you know, the, 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 the peak, but there are other examples too of one-on-one -on -one that are damaging. And, and while certainly I want to be someone who advocates for mercy and empathy and grace, I also think about the victims who will never get justice in this life for what happened to them. And I just wonder, like, I guess what I'm thinking through is, and I, I'm kind of streaming some thoughts together in the moment, but if people have, have free will in some sense and people choose to use their body and their, their ability to, to, to either bring human flourishing or human chaos on the earth, and they bring about human chaos time and time again, at the end of the day, like, can God tolerate that kind of behavior in a redeemed world, right? Now, maybe there's this passing through the flames idea, like you said, and, and, and we're these new people that, that A, the victim is like, oh my God, I, I am, I, I, that sense of justice is quenched, right? And, and, and the victimizer is like, oh my God, I can't believe I did all this and I repent. But at the other side of it, there's a part of me that says, I just do. I I don't know. Like I I just think, isn't it more just that 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 they have forfeited their right to maybe eternal life based on the dehumanization of the other? But then I think, well, then am I repeating the cycle? Am I part of the cycle of chaos <laughs> now? Right, advocating for more dehumanization, but also I'm not a victim. And so, is it my place to yeah. even make that? Is it my my place to even speculate on on something that I personally have not experienced? So that's what I'm thinking through in a nutshell as you're talking. I would love just sure. some of your thoughts. No, I, I mean I I totally understand Tim, and I and you're right. I'm sure there's plenty of people who are listening and who are just like, man, Keith, you're pissing me off, and I I can't go there, yeah. and I get it. But I, I I think it's I would say our struggle with this level of grace and with this level of forgiveness, our struggle with this, with letting go of this idea of retributive justice and switching instead to a restorative justice. Hmm. I think that's the key. I think it's that what makes this so hard for us now to hear this um, and say, this is good, is that we're not there yet, right? We We aren't yet ourselves transformed to the place where we can say, you know what? Restorative justice is better than, than uh, sort of like, uh, you know, retributive justice, hmm. that it is good. Right. And so it's not, I'm not saying that they, you, there's something bad about you or you're just not a good person. If you feel this, I mean, I, again, it's a human thing. Of course you we've been, anyone who's experienced this kind of abuse or, or violence or who suffered in horrible ways or had someone you love, you know, yeah. murdered or tortured yeah. or killed. I mean, oh my gosh. Um, yeah. I'm not, I'm not expecting really anybody 
who's undergone that kind of level of suffering to understand that or even fully accept that now. I, I understand if you're like, you know what, I can't because this is still so painful and real and raw to me. Hmm. And maybe you never will. You know, maybe, maybe that's not something you ever will. I, I do believe that once we have gone through this re- restorative, redemptive process, um, we will all be changed into people where we will say, yeah, you know, this is better. This is good. Um, I mean, otherwise I feel like, you know, we're putting, we're putting limits on God's grace and forgiveness and mercy. Like God can forgive and transform to a point, but then after that, uh, he can't, right. That there is something that he can't do. Um, so yeah. I don't know. I, I guess yeah. I look at it like hmm. the other image that I think is so beautiful and it's really the way the new Testament ends, right. Is that idea of the, the new Jerusalem and, and, uh, you know, that from flowing from the throne of Christ are these rivers of living water, and on either side are these trees with whose leaves are for healing of the nations. The nations, by the way, is code for all the people that hate God and went to war with God. And in the whole book of Revelation, mm-hmm. there this whole massive battle. It's the nations that are rising up. It's the nations that are coming against Jesus. And so, in the end, the nations are all outside the walls, right? But the walls, the, it says, there are gates that are never shut. Mm-hmm. Those gates never, ever shut. And then the, this, I love this is how, this is how Revelation in, in the New Testament ends. It ends with the voice calling out from inside the city. Is anyone thirsty? Well, come and drink freely from this river of living water. And by the way, while you're there quenching that thirst with this river of living water, look up. There's trees that you're under. Grab some of those leaves because the, the purpose of those leaves is only this to bring your healing. I Mm. think that is the final image. I think that to me is the final message. There is, there is an endless extension of grace. There is an endless invitation for restoration to receive the gift of life, to be healed and restored. And I believe that is ultimately what it is. I think that's what we're, what we're offered. Um, I, I mean, again, I, I don't know that it's possible, um, to resolve these kind of conflicts that we may have against this idea of a radical mercy and forgiveness, a radical grace, a, a radical transformation of even the most evil people we could possibly imagine. Right. Um, I, and again, I, I doubt I, I could ever do that on this side, <laughs> but yeah, I think right. on the other side, yeah. we are all going to experience such a wonderful transformation and become these new people um, who genuinely love mercy. We will love mercy. And not just for ourselves, we'll love seeing other people experience this endless, incredible, overwhelming mercy of God. Something that has helped me um, with some of this stuff uh, is just trusting. I can't say I have uh, objective evidence you know, of this, but trusting that at the end of the day, a good God will do good. Yes. Um, even if I can't see it or fully fathom how what seems like paradoxes are reconciled, right? And I think maybe that, yeah. that's an element of trust uh, or what or what some of us might call faith, not to trigger anyone listening, right? But this idea <laughs> of like, you know, I don't, I, obviously God by definition is, is not fully understandable or else we would be God if we fully understood them. But yeah. so maybe there's this element of like, you know, I don't know how the end of all things happens. I don't know what's on the other side of, uh, of this life, but I have to trust that the center is a good God who who understands and knows and is working in a way that reconciles all things, um, including my own healing, right, and my own brokenness, and my the own, and the times I've been right the victimizer and not just the victim. So maybe mm-hmm. maybe those things I have to have faith are are in process, uh, even if I can't understand right now how does this all work together. I think yes. at least for me that kind of helps me sleep a little bit better at night. That it's not my job to figure that out. My job is to emulate Jesus as best as I know how every day. Yeah, that's Tim. That was a better answer. I totally agree. Because I think no matter where we end, if we can all, and I think most of us could agree with that. I, I think almost any of you would, would at least be able to agree with the part that you said. And I, I have said much the same to myself. Like, you know what? Whatever happens in the end, I do have this trust, this yeah. belief that God is love and God right. is good. 
And anyone who finds themselves at the mercy of that God is going to experience the love of God. And whatever that God does will be pure, true justice. And it will be the right thing. And we don't have to worry about that. So I agree with you on that. That's great. Um, listen, Keith, it was, um, you know, I think, I think that that's a great note to end this conversation on. Obviously, we can go a lot longer, but we're already an hour and 15 in, which is <laughs> over my usual time. Uh, and okay. the audience, if you stuck through all the way, thanks so much. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Keith, where can folks find you? I mean, are you on the social medias or I, obviously you're on Amazon, but where mm-hmm. can people engage with your work? You're in our Facebook community group, a uh, shameless yep. plug for anyone who yes. wants to hop on there and, and talk to Keith more direct. But yeah, where can people find you? Yeah. So yes, I am on um, Facebook and Instagram, uh, Twitter. We'll see. Uh, it's probably Oof. single digits how long I'm going to stick around there, but yeah. we'll see. Um, but yeah, I also do. So I, my blog is on Pathios. It's just, you can find it by going to keithgiles.com. It redirects to my Pathios blog. Um, I do three podcasts. I do a, a solo podcast called Second Cup with Keith, where I talk about this kind of stuff. Um, I do a, a podcast with Matthew Stefano called Apostates Anonymous, and it's a blast. I have so much fun. Uh, we make fake ads for fake sponsors. That's the best thing about it. So if nothing else, for no other reason, you have to listen uh, to all of the fake that. sponsors that we that we come up with. <laughs> and then I do another podcast I've been doing for like five, four or five years now called Heretic Happy Hour with a whole bunch of people. Uh, and that's a lot of fun as well. So yeah, you can find me in all those different places. My books are on Amazon. Go and check them out. And if you have any questions about what we've talked about today, I'd be happy to interact. Great. Keith, So thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Tim. Thank you.